all moms worry, right? I mean, motherhood tempts many moms to worry, especially about the well-being of our children. Are they breathing? How can I keep them healthy? Are they making friends at school? What if they don't make friends at school? But for moms who experience anxiety, worry quickly elevates into debilitating overwhelm, fear, and doubt. This can make the normal task of motherhood overwhelming and joyless. So today we are going to be talking about anxiety in motherhood. Welcome back to your hope-filled perspective, where it's always our goal to restore hope, renew minds, and empower listeners to live in their God-given identity. I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Bankson, and I'm always grateful when you decide to spend a few minutes of your week with us. I want to remind you of a verse that comes from Psalm 94, verse 19, that says, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. That's where we want to be. But what about in the reality that sometimes anxiety is just overwhelming, especially for moms? My guest today is Courtney Devich, who's a mama relying on Jesus and reheated coffee every day. (laughs) I can still relate to that. (laughs) Using humor and honesty and relatability, she writes with a heart for the mom struggling with anxiety or depression. She's a former human resources professional, and she uses her leadership skills to manage kids as a stay-at-home mom. You can find her in the Starbucks line at her local Target, binge watching TV with her husband, or chasing a kid or two at her home in Michigan. There are so many things about her bio that I can relate to, and it's my joy and delight to welcome her to the program. Welcome, Courtney. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad that you're on the program today. Here's something that I have learned through 30 years of interviewing people, and especially on the podcast, and that is that frequently our ministry comes out of our own hurts and needs and experiences. So I wonder if you might share with our audience how that is true for you. Yeah. So for me, I... I've been struggling, I would say, with anxiety my entire life. Um, I wasn't, like, formally diagnosed until I was 19 years old. And it was kind of one of those, I went in for, I went into a cardiologist to get checked out because I was having chest pains. Um, And they're like, no, everything's right, all right with your heart. You have anxiety. I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Um, It was like one of those, I don't know why we didn't think of this sooner. Um, But I think that the conversation around childhood anxiety is we're becoming more aware of it now as parents. And I've even, like seen some signs in my own children, um, which then causes me to have anxiety about them having anxiety, which there's a whole chapter in the book about that. Um, But I, so I, you know, had it basically my entire life, but as soon as I became a mom, it just amplified it. And uh, between having preterm birth, high risk pregnancy, uh, just even like the as normal worries that mothers have as far as SIDS and the swaddle blanket and feeding, are they getting enough milk and all of those things? Um, I would say that motherhood uh, made it debilitating. And then you uh, add in the world that we've lived in the last three years. Um, COVID um, put me in a crippling state with my anxiety because of the fear of losing my children, which I think is every mother's greatest fear. But when you have that fear with an anxiety disorder, your anxiety tends to make you believe that it's going to happen. Um, so I had hunkered down in my home. I quit my job, um, because of my anxiety (laughs) when the, when COVID hit and, um, I became a stay at home mom at that point, but I was not able to enjoy stay at home motherhood. I wasn't, um, going out and doing things with my kids, play dates at the park or anything like that. Just in these four walls of my home, sanitizing everything, uh, taking my clothes off when I came home from wherever, just um, a lot of uh, obsessive compulsive stuff that came out of that as far as cleanliness and wiping things down. And it was stealing my joy in motherhood. And that's kind of where the book just kind of breathed life there. I just, I started writing through COVID and, um, the whole journey I was on as I was writing it. Um, I was still kind of hunkered down in my home when I first submitted this book proposal. And so I've gone through the entire process of coming back on my way to journeying to joy. Um, as, as I wrote the book. I think that was so good that you were writing through it. 
you yes. know, sometimes <laughs> when we lose, when we look back, we lose some of the details. We forget yes. some of the high points that we think we would never forget. But I think what you just expressed right there is common to so many people, whether they're moms or dads or not even married. Mm -hmm. COVID just brought about a whole new level, a new realm of anxiety that we were not prepared to deal with. And I know that you mentioned that you've always struggled with anxiety. And so that makes the likelihood of experiencing greater anxiety during a major crisis even greater. But you said that it really heightened when you had kids. So for our listeners, will you share what were you feeling as a new mom and how did that impact your anxiety that was already present? Yeah. Um, so my first child was uh, the whole circumstance around his birth was just not what they would prepare you for when you go through childbirth classes and everything. My water sporadically broke at 36 weeks. um, And I was not in labor, but my blood pressure was through the roof. I had developed preeclampsia. So I was uh, on magnesium and uh, throughout the entire labor process, they had to then induce me to get baby out. Um, When he first came out, he was not breathing. And so I didn't get to do that much of that skin to skin. He was rushed away and there was just a whole swarm of people in that, in that labor room as his um, heart rate was dropping and everything. And then um, after that, he was born at five pounds, nine ounces, and I wasn't able to nurse. And I, I felt such, there was so much pressure on me to get that baby to latch and breast is best. And that was like, there was no other option. Like the I was feeding him through a syringe for two weeks with donor milk because bottle and nipple confusion and it couldn't even like give him a pacifier. So that whole experience was overwhelming as a first time mother, not knowing like what to do. Um, My instinct was telling me like this baby just needs milk. Like, you know, I, whether it's donor milk or formula, he needs to be fed. Um, and just the anxiety of, is he gaining enough going in for those weekly weight checks? Um, and then add on pregnancy number two, the anxiety of, am I going to have another preterm birth? Because they statistically told me that once you have a preterm baby, they usually are even earlier afterwards. So I was like, waiting for like weeks 30 on, I was going into triage. My anxiety was convincing me that this baby was coming early. And, um, I, because it was deemed high risk, I was doing uh, baby aspirin to keep that blood pressure down. We were doing progesterone injections to keep my water from breaking early again. So baby number two was, um, just the whole pregnancy was very anxiety filled. Um, I've now had baby number three. <laughs> uh, and actually it's a, it's a, one of those stories I like to wrap it up here because in the book, in the last chapter, I talk about um, some things that my anxiety has tried to tell me that I shouldn't do, like starting a podcast or doing a speaking event. And one of the things was having another child. We'd always talked about number three, but my anxiety was trying to tell me like, you don't want to go through another high-risk pregnancy or have another preterm birth. And just the idea of having another child to worry about also gave me anxiety. Um, But after submitting this book proposal, about three weeks later, we found out we're pregnant with baby number three. So as I said, I went through the journey on the way back to joy and I decided that anxiety was not going to take my joy and baby number three was going to happen and be complete our family. So um, we welcomed a little one four months ago. So uh, and that pregnancy was the most peaceful pregnancy I've had, I would say. Um, I had uh, gestational hypertension and blood pressure raised and everything after he was born. Um, but he's he's thriving. He's so healthy. He's 17 pounds. I went to his checkup this morning. So he's a big boy. <laughs> well, congratulations. Thank you. Baby number three. That's exciting. Yeah. So often moms tell their kids, I'm your mom. It's my job to worry. But some would say worrying is a very normal part of parenting. Mm -hmm. What happens when worry is amplified and crosses over from worry to anxiety? Or in other words, for people who may not understand anxiety, from your perspective, what is it like to live with? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that I'm a mom, it's my job to worry. That's actually a quote from my own mother. So <laughs> that's what I've been told <laughs> my entire childhood um, and into my adulthood as well. Um, she still says that to this day. So um, the idea that, yes, we're going to worry as moms, especially I think there's it's hard not to in the world that we live in because we've got access to, I mean, the news and everything that's going on in the world out, outside of the walls of our home um, between school shootings and um, kidnapping. And then, you know, we had a tornado warning just the other night here in Michigan and we were hunkered down in my basement. So just all these worries about our children's safety in this world we live in. And that is, I think, fairly common um, if we are as moms to be worried about things like that and conscious of it. Now, where I would say when it gets amplified to the point of it's uh, anxiety disorder, it's taking away your joys, is that worry and that fear dictating your decisions regarding your child. Um, so, you know, deciding to um, not go to a certain event or do a certain thing because um, what if you know, it's always those what ifs that come through your mind. Like, what if this were to happen? Um, what if my child were to be endangered if I were to go to this place? Like maybe, I don't know. Um, for example, like a sporting event. Like I've, I get a little claustrophobic these days <laughs> with big crowds and everything and worries. And, and then it's like, okay, what if there was like a mass shooting right now in this place? And I'm like, I'm here with my child. So little example of that, like trying to avoid things like that, that it's just a what if scenario that's gone in through your mind and that's anxiety playing its role in, in that voice in your head. Um, for people who don't know what anxiety is, it's that persistent worry that just is taking away, it's, it's affecting your daily life. So for me, it's um, worrying about germs and getting on my children when I see their fingers up their nose or their thumb in their mouth. Um, and just that anxiety of, oh, no, you're going to get sick. And well, they're going to get sick. It's just going to happen. It's week two of school already. And we already have a cold in this house. So it's going to happen. I just have to kind of accept that <laughs> and not get on my children because I also don't want to pass my anxiety on down to them either, which is something that I am still continuing to work through is um, my three-year-old daughter was in the front yard the other day and I'm like, no, you can't be out here by yourself. Like, what are you doing? Stay in the backyard. Like, what if somebody kidnapped you? <laughs> She's like wide-eyed at me. Like, what are you talking about, mom? So it is um, just that persistent worry that's affecting your everyday life and causing you not to sleep, causing you to make decisions um, based off of that worry, that what if that's going through your mind and just the racing thoughts, which is probably like the worst thing for me is not being able to sleep because of the racing thoughts that play out in my mind. Um, and then as a result, the irritability and not, you know, being tired because of that. So, um, that's, in a nutshell, how worrying, plain and simple. That's how I would define anxiety. And the thing is, worry begets worry. Like, yeah. you, you never run out of things to worry about. So oh, yes. you've got to find a way to halt the cycle. Mm -hmm. And it's exhausting if trying to con in trying to control our worry, we're trying to prevent all the things that we're worried might happen because yes. it is impossible to prevent all those things. We are just not in that much control of our lives. I mean, yes. if you really think about it, we really are not. And so friends, if you are struggling with anxiety, I want you to know that we, both Courtney and I understand and we want you to know there is hope. We are going to continue this conversation with Courtney Devage about anxiety and motherhood after this break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to your Hope-Filled Perspective, where today we are talking to Courtney Devich about anxiety and motherhood. This is a real thing. And I think so many moms struggle, mm -hmm. but there's still so much stigma attached to mental health issues. I do think we are making great strides. I think more people are becoming aware, primarily because more people are dealing with it since mm -hmm. the global pandemic. 
perhaps look down on people who struggled with depression and anxiety before, but once you experience it, you have a new level of compassion for those Mm -hmm. who experience it. So Courtney, I'd love for you to talk about how have you dealt with the stigma of mental health issues? So for me, I've been very, very lucky as far as my church family um, being supportive of me, of this book. Um, I have a lot of friends who also struggle with anxiety and me opening up and sharing about my story has then made them so they can come to me and talk to me about theirs as well. Um, However, when you are posting about your mental illness to um, thousands of people on social media, um, because social media is not kind, you get a lot of comments. Um, So things like Satan is in me and that I don't need medicine or pharma, I need more Jesus and I need to pray more are comments that I have gotten. Um, Normally, uh, yes. (laughs) And uh, normally um, I try to give as much grace as possible because a lot of times I know that these are um, comments that are coming from a place of ignorance. They don't, they don't know. They've never been through it. They don't know anybody who has been through it. Or if they do, then I really pray they haven't spoken to their family or friends like that. Um, But a lot of times they just don't truly know. They don't know the science behind it. They don't know what it's like living with it. Um, And so I have, I mean, either I uh, just hit the block button because sometimes I'm just not in the mood because to be honest, it's not great for my mental health either to be dealing with this. Um, But I keep posting about it because every time I post about it, I get um, you know, maybe one or two comments like that, but I get then five, 10 messages and DMs and comments from people who say, thank you. I struggle as well. Um, so that's what keeps me going. Um, but normally I just, you know, explain to them that my relationship with God is between me and him. And, um, I believe that actually my mental illness is what has drawn me closer to him. Um, because when I'm anxious, I'm turning to him in prayer. And when I am depressed, um, he is my light in the darkness and, um, my only hope. So, and then I just kind of like gracefully say like, this is actually a mental illness. And I would pray you wouldn't say that to somebody who has diabetes or cancer um, because it is in fact uh, a medical condition. And that is, that diagnosis is also between me and my doctor as well. Um, so just trying to decide like, okay, is this, is this going to be worth having the conversation? <laughs> if not, then maybe it's uh, just, okay, move on or you're in my case, the block button. Um, or is it a, okay, this person just needs to be educated and they just need to know the science behind it and really what it is like living with a mental illness um, because they don't know. To the mom who's worried that going to counseling or taking medication makes her a quote unquote bad Christian. I would say no, it does not, because that um, God has given doctors, therapists, you, all of you, like he's given you the tools, the knowledge and the skills to help those of us that struggle with anxiety and depression. Um, God is not limited on how he can heal us. Just like if somebody were to have diabetes and needs and in, need insulin, like You're not going to say, oh, I'm a bad Christian because I take this insulin. You're going to take it. Um, And the same goes for if you need therapy or medication. It is one of the ways that God can heal you or at least treat you and help you because obviously he is our ultimate healer. And I've I've said in the book that I don't know if I'll ever be fully healed this side of heaven, um, but I will be eventually in heaven. Um, And anxiety is highly treatable. Um, and there's no shame in taking that little white pill or going to therapy. It does not make you a bad mom. It does not make you a bad Christian. Um, it makes you strong because when, when you are weak, he is strong and he will see you through and, um, help you and heal you on the other side there. And then it also makes you a better mom because I'll be honest, like when I'm struggling with my mental health, I'm snappy and irritable with my kids and my kids deserve me to be feeling my best. And that includes mentally healthy as well as my physical health. Facing panic attacks can, it can just feel so insurmountable, especially in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I know that some of our listeners have experienced that. 
What are some biblical truths that moms can focus on when this happens? Mm -hmm. Um, So I know like when a panic attack strikes, it can just feel like you're not in control of anything and you're, you're nauseous, you're dizzy. Um, It's, it takes over your whole body because it's that fight or flight just completely coursing through your, your body and, um, it takes over. So I, the biblical truth that I point, um, out in the book is Romans 8, 26 through 27, that, um, the spirit intercedes in our weakness and prays for us. So if you're like lying on the bathroom floor and you're in the middle of a panic attack, just remember that the Holy spirit is with you. He's within you. And he is praying on your behalf. If you're not able to get that prayer out because you're too dizzy, you're nauseous or vomiting or whatever it may be and lightheaded. Um, he is with you in that moment and he will sustain you and get you onto the other side of that. It sometimes it may be five minutes, sometimes maybe 10 minutes, but he is going to be right there with you. And doesn't always mean that another panic attack will never show up as it could. Um, I make the joke several times in the book that having anxiety about having anxiety is a thing. So if we're having anxiety about having another panic attack, it may actually cause you to have more panic attacks. So just remembering that if it were to happen again, that he is with you and he will strengthen you, sustain you and pray for you on your behalf. Yeah. The thing to remember when you're in the midst of a panic attack is that it will end. It doesn't feel like it yes. wouldn't, but it will. And if you can just tell yourself to breathe, mm-hmm. this is momentary. And like you said, Courtney, more momentary could mean five moments, minutes mm-hmm. Or, mm-hmm. or longer, but it is time limited. And if you can tell yourself to breathe, that can help regulate that autonomic nervous system that is mm-hmm. going haywire. Mm-hmm. It's nothing to laugh at. It is nothing to make fun of. It can feel literally like you are going to die. Yeah. But I love your advice to remember that when you have a hard time thinking of anything but the panic, we do have a Holy Spirit who intercedes for us. Mm-hmm. If you can remember it's momentary. You will get through it. But the more you allow yourself to become anxious about the panic attack, the longer (laughs) it will last. So take heart. It won't last forever. And remember Mm -hmm. to breathe. Friends, we're going to talk about some more tips about how to deal with anxiety specifically in motherhood after this break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to your hope-filled perspective. Courtney, if a mom is relating to our conversation today and she's struggling with anxiety. What suggestion do you have that she might begin to implement even today to start to make a small change for the better in her life? Yeah. Um, so I, I talk about baby steps a lot in the book. So like each chapter ends with baby steps. Cause it was, as I was sort of coming back out of everything I'd been through with COVID and early births and all that. It was just taking those baby steps and just um, not getting down on yourself. If you ever like go step back or regress in a little ways, um, because sometimes that does happen. Um, So that would be one thing that I would just constantly remind yourself is that it doesn't mean that you're always going to be like this. Like sometimes we take a step back, but baby steps forward. Um, So I have this acronym though that I um, put into the book and it's worry. Worry is the acronym. I thought it was really clever there. Um, so the the acronym then, um, when you have those racing thoughts and those worries, <laughs> um, the word of God is the W. So turning to God's word, what does he have to say about whatever it is that you're anxious about, whether it's um, school choices for your kids or bottle or breast vaccines, like whatever, Um just turning to him. And obviously the word of God doesn't have anything to say to you about vaccines, but what does it say about whatever it is that you're going through in that that moment and what you're thinking about observing the thought? So is it rational or is it irrational? A lot of times I have to actually talk to my husband because my anxiety will try to convince me that it's a rational fear and that I'm playing all the what ifs are through. So he can usually, unless it's something he's anxious about too, he can usually talk me down and say, um, no, this is 
what you need to do, or this is how you need to think about it. That does not need to be taking your joy in this moment or um, your sleep away from you either. Um, the first R is retreat away from it and run away from the th thought. So guard your mind. Um, say like, nope, that thought doesn't deserve my attention right now. I'm moving on to the next thing and thinking about something else. And that, I mean, is very true of like intrusive thoughts. Um, and especially when those worries are running in the middle of the night there, the second R is request. So you're going to pray about it. <laughs> Just R was, I needed another R. So, but you're going to pray about it and you're going to talk to God about it, whatever it is that's worrying you. And a lot of times these can be done in and whatever order you want to do, you don't have to start at the W and go all the way down. And then the why is you're not alone, which is something that I talk about in the book a lot, um, is that the Holy Spirit is within you. You're never alone. And then also just the um, reassurance and knowing that you are not the only the mom who's dealing with this there. I mean, my inbox is proof that I've got thousands of other moms that have anxiety. Um, and I, women are twice as likely, more than twice as likely than men to develop anxiety. So guarantee you, um, you know, somebody who has anxiety. And if you remember that and that you're not alone and you start talking about it and sharing it with other moms, you're going to find that support system um, of other moms who can help you that are also walking through anxiety. Because you've gone through this, can you share with the listeners what they might be able to do to help their spouse better understand and know how to respond appropriately. Mm -hmm. Because I would imagine that there are enough listeners who are thinking, but my spouse doesn't understand, yeah. or they do things that are actually hurting rather than helping. Mm -hmm. Um. So I, I, yeah, I get that question a lot. My husband doesn't understand, or he's telling me just to, to get over it. Um, stop worrying about it. And those are like comments that are not, not helpful at all. Um, my situation is my husband also is, has diagnosed anxiety. Um, so sometimes our anxiety feeds off of each other. Uh, though, although sometimes it is like, okay, things that make me anxious doesn't make him anxious. And I'm like, okay, why aren't you anxious about this? Can we get on the same like level here? Um, but for for me specifically, when I was going, when I've gone through depression, that's something my husband does not understand. Um, and when we first um, started dating, I talk about this in the book a little bit, he did not understand why I needed a pill to make me happy. He thought that, you know, well, don't, don't I make you happy? Um, and so there was a lot of educating <laughs> and a lot of just conversation about what it is that goes through in my brain. And having those honest conversations. And right now, I, I'll be honest, I'm also struggling with some postpartum depression. And so when I'm having intrusive thoughts, I'm going to him and I'm telling him about it. And sometimes I'm like nervous and anxious about the response I'm going to get because of the thought. They're intrusive for a reason. They're not, they're not pretty all the time. Um, but telling him about it and opening up to him and letting him know what's going on in this brain of mine um, has helped. And I think him seeing just seeing me crumbling down on the bathroom floor in the middle of a panic attack, seeing me crying uncontrollably for whatever reason, and I'm depressed, like he's seen it as he's lived just alongside me as well. Um, so to the, the mom who's has a spouse who just doesn't really understand, I would just say trying to educate them as best as you can. And maybe it's having them come with you to speak to your doctor about medication or something like that. Like it took me a really long time to get my husband to open up to the idea of one that he had anxiety as well and that he also needed to be medicated. Um, so, you know, having them have that conversation with your doctor, um, taking him to go meet your therapist. It sounds like a fun date night. I know, but, um, just really educating them and letting them in on what's going on in that brain of yours, because then they'll eventually kind of start seeing like, okay, yes, there's, she needs my help. She needs my support. She needs me to love her through this and whatever that may mean, whether it's she's getting on some medication or she needs me to watch the kids while she goes to therapy, like, um, just praying that he'll, he'll, he'll help you through it. I think that's a really good idea to, and you can phrase it in such a way that 
one way you can support me is if you would come with me to this appointment. Yes. Hard for me to fully explain to you, but I think you would be able to understand it better from my doctor, my counselor, my therapist. Yeah. And I truly believe that most spouses want to help. They don't know how to help. And if they've never gone through it, their attempts to help can sometimes be counterproductive. So if Mm -hmm. we can educate, here's what would be helpful. And one of the most helpful things is come with me Mm -hmm. so you can understand it from a better perspective. So thank Mm -hmm. you for offering that. Courtney, as we wrap up this episode, if a listener is resonating with our conversation today, maybe they are experiencing anxiety or maybe they have a spouse who is experiencing anxiety or a parent, what hope-filled perspective would you want to leave them with today? That you don't need to be ashamed of it. It doesn't make you a bad Christian. It's not something that you need to hide. Um, It is something that I believe God can use for good because he turns all things for good. We know that. Um, And so whether that's, uh, you know, whether, whether he's making it so that you are able to put your trust in him more and grow in a relationship with him, or maybe he's growing you closer to him. Like I said, like my faith has grown stronger because of my anxiety and my depression too. Um, but he will turn it for good either way. Um, and that you're not alone and there is no shame in any of it and no shame in getting help. Yeah. I want to reiterate that shame never comes from God. Nope. It does not. <laughs> That comes from the enemy of our soul. Mm -hmm. And so if you are hearing in your mind those messages that I should be ashamed of this, or I should be embarrassed of this, or I don't want anybody to know, that's coming from the enemy because he seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. And the last thing he wants is for you to draw closer to God Mm -hmm. through this and to be an example to other people. So please hear, there is no shame in dealing with depression, anxiety, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, (sighs) you name it. That's not coming from your heavenly father. Friends, I want to leave you with the scripture that comes out of Psalm 56, verse three. And it's just simply this. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. There is no better place for you to put your trust. While I am an advocate of medical treatment and counseling and therapy, and I think that is wonderful, first of all, put your trust in God and ask him to direct your steps because he will never leave you or forsake you. And he can give you so much comfort in the middle of the night when that anxiety is overwhelming mm-hmm. So draw closer to him. Courtney, thank you for sharing from your own heartache and pain and experience to give encouragement and hope to our listeners. Friends, I'm going to put all the information about Courtney and her book in the show notes that you can find at drmichellebee.com. And friends, anxiety is rampant. I guarantee you have at least two handfuls of friends or family members who struggle. They may not make you aware of it, but I guarantee you know at least 10 people who struggle with anxiety. So would you consider sharing this podcast to give others hope, help, and encouragement through their anxious times? And while you're at it, consider subscribing to the podcast so you don't miss a single episode. And it would mean the world to me if you would consider rating it and reviewing it to help others find a hope-filled perspective. Courtney, I thank you. I pray that this book does well. And we'll put all the information about that in our show notes at drmichellebee.com. Thank you for having me. It's been a great episode, an important episode, and I hope that it's encouraged you. Until we meet again next week, it's my prayer for you that you have a hope-filled week.